The dentist looked at Wheelie and she forced a little smile and handed me the list again. Then she fished a warm bit of honey out of her pocket and gave it to me right there in front of the dentist, even though Louisa had once told me that you might as well whack your own teeth with a wrench as eat bits of honey. I set out with my list. Don't get the kids all at once, the dentist called after me. Bring them in twos. I decided to get the little kids first. I knocked on their classroom doors and their teachers came hurrying to see my note, and the kids were handed over to me. I walked the two kindergartners to the dentist office, read my book in the waiting room for a while, and then went back for a second grader and a fourth grader. It was a lot of climbing up and down stairs. Not in a million years could I imagine Wheelie doing this. When I got back to the dentist with my second drop, one of the kindergartners was already waiting to go back to class. She had this big smiley tooth sticker on her shirt. I brought her back to her classroom and then went for the last kid on my list, a sixth grader like me, Marcus Hilbronner, in class 6506. I'd never heard of him. I knocked on the little window in the classroom door, waving my paper. The teacher, Mr. Anderson, came over, and I showed him my list. Marcus, he called, and a boy stood up. It was the boy who hit Sal. He'd gotten a very short haircut, but he was definitely the same person. My brain started yelling at me. It's the kid who hit Sal. He goes to your school. The kid who hit Sal goes to your school? And meanwhile, the kid had walked over to where I was standing with Mr. Anderson. Dentist appointment, Mr. Anderson whispered. Marcus nodded, went back to his desk, picked up a book, and then walked right past me and out the door. I followed a few steps behind him. He knew the way. Welcome back, Marcus, the dentist called from an exam room. Nice haircut. The fourth grader was in the big chair, spitting into the little white sink. The other two kids were all stickered up and waiting to go back to class. Marcus sat down heavily and opened his book, which was called Concepts in Mathematics. Mr. Tompkin acted like everyone in our class was part of one big happy math group, but it didn't take much to figure out there was a system. Red math books for genius kids like Jay Stringer, orange ones for kids like me who did okay, and yellow ones for kids who left the room twice a week to meet with Miss Dudley, who did math support. Marcus's book was different, thick with a hard cover and small type, so I guess that even though it was blue, even further down the rainbow than yellow, it was at least the equivalent of a red. You like math, huh? I said. He looked up and I got the strong feeling he didn't remember he had seen me before, that he didn't remember punching Sal or talking to me about the sun. Yeah, he said slowly, like he thought I might be stupid or something. I like math. And he went back to reading. I delivered the two waiting kids back to their classes. One of them was holding a shiny paper card shaped like an apple that said she needed a follow-up visit. There was a little line for her mom to sign. Cavity, I thought grimly. When I got back to the dentist office, the fourth grader was still in the chair and Marcus was still reading his math book. That was fine with me. I grabbed my book from the table where I'd left it and settled back to read. Some people think it's possible, you know, Marcus mumbled. What? He pointed at my book. Time travel. Some people think it's possible. Except those ladies lied at the beginning of the book. What? Those ladies in the book, Miss What, Miss Where, and Miss Who? Miss What's It, Miss Who, and Miss Which? I corrected him. He shrugged. What do you mean they lied? They never lied. I was getting annoyed. The truth is, I hate to think about other people reading my book. It's like watching someone go through the box of private stuff that I kept under my bed. Don't you remember? He leaned forward in his chair. They're traveling through time, right? All over the universe, right? And they promised that girl they'll have her back home five minutes before she left, but they don't. How do you know they don't get her home five minutes before she left? I mean, there's no clock or anything. They might leave at night and get back at the same night. Maybe they left at 8.30 and got back at 8.25. 
He laughed. You don't need a clock. Think. At the beginning of that book, that girl walks through the vegetable garden. Meg. Huh? You keep saying that girl. Her name is Meg. So she walks to the far side of the vegetable garden and sits on this stone wall, right? So she can see the garden where she's sitting and talking with that boy, right? And then those ladies show up and take them away. His name is Calvin. And so what if they can see the garden? So the garden is where they appear when they get back home at the end of the book, remember? They land in the broccoli. So if they had gotten home five minutes before they left, like those ladies promised they would, they would have seen themselves get back before they left. I put my book down and shook my head. Think about it. They hadn't even left yet. How could they have gotten back already? They didn't even know for sure whether they would get back. It doesn't matter whether they knew it. That's got nothing to do with it. He leaned back and shoved his hands in his pockets. If they land in the broccoli, at 8.25, they should be in the broccoli at 8.25, period. That makes no sense, I said. What if they couldn't do it? Save Meg's father and get back in one piece. Then they wouldn't have landed in the broccoli at all. But they did do it, right? Yes, but the end can't happen before the middle. He smiled. Why can't it? I don't know. It's common sense. Common sense. Have you read Relativity? You know by Einstein? I glared at him. Einstein says common sense is just the habit of thought. It's how we're used to thinking about things. But a lot of the time it just gets in the way. In the way of what? In the way of what's true. I mean, it used to be common sense that the world was flat and the sun revolved around it. But at some point, someone had to reject that assumption. Or at least question it. Well, obviously somebody did. Well, duh. Copernicus did. Look, all I'm saying is that at the end of the book, they don't get back five minutes before they left. Or they would have seen themselves get back before they left. I gave up. It was dark in the garden, I said. Maybe they just couldn't see themselves from where they were sitting. I thought of that, he said. But they would have heard all the yelling and the dog. My God, what does it matter? It's a story. Someone made it up. Do you realize that, don't you? He shrugged. The story is made up, but time travel is possible. In theory. I've read articles about it. Wow, you really do like math, don't you? He smiled again. With his super short hair, his head looked like a perfectly round ball when he smiled. This is more like physics. Fine, you really like physics, don't you? Yeah. He picked up my book from the table and flipped through it. Actually, I almost had the same conversation with my teacher right after I read this. She didn't understand me at first either. She? Mr. Anderson is a he. You really don't know as much about people, do you? Not Mr. Anderson. This was in second grade. I wrote a book report about it. In second grade, he put down the book. Yeah, back in Detroit, where we used to live, till last year. But I don't talk about this kind of stuff anymore. Usually. Why not? He shot me a look. People don't want to think about it. I can see why, I said. It makes my head hurt. Still, you did better than most people. You're a pretty smart kid. I rolled my eyes. Gee, thanks. Okay, Marcus, the dentist chirped from the other room. You're up. I watched Marcus slip into the big chair and begin to read his math book again, holding it up with one hand while the dentist worked from the other side. The fourth grader waited for me by the door with his sticker on. Miranda, you can go back to your class, the dentist called. Marcus is going to be here a while. He can walk himself upstairs when we're through. So I picked up my book and hiked back up the stairs with the fourth grader. As we started down the hallway to his classroom, he stopped, and I waited while he peeled the sticker off his shirt, folded it, and stuck it in his pocket. Things that smell. For a long time, Colin was just this short kid who seemed to end up in my class every year. In third grade, he and I spent a week convincing Alice Evans that velour was a kind of animal fur, and she refused to wear it for the rest of the year. 
but aside from that, we'd never hung out together. I'd seen him with his skateboard in the park a few times, and he'd always let me have a turn on it, but that was all. And then suddenly he was everywhere. He came downstairs with me and Anna Marie at lunch, or yelled, hold up, and walked to Broadway with us after school to get drinks at Jimmy's sandwich shop. It was Colin who had the idea to ask Jimmy for a job. I'm pretty sure he was kidding. Colin was always saying weird stuff to people that made you partly proud to know him and partly wish you weren't standing next to him. Attention-seeking is what Mom would call him. Hey, Colin said to Jimmy after school one day in the beginning of November when we were paying for our Cokes. You're always alone in here. How about talking to the owner about giving us jobs? I'm the owner, Jimmy said. Jimmy said. And who's us? It was, Aunt, it was me, Anna Marie, and Colin standing there. Us, Colin said. We could work after school. Jimmy grabbed a pickle chunk out of the setup tray, which I didn't know the name of yet, and tossed it into his mouth. I don't need help that late. What about when I open up? We have lunch at 1045, Colin said. A stupidly early lunch. At our school, the older you get, the stupider your lunch period. Jimmy nodded. That works. I didn't think Jimmy was serious, but Colin said we should show up at lunchtime the next day just in case. And it turned out that he was serious. The three of us worked during lunch for the rest of that week. We washed a lot of greasy plastic trays, weighed piles of sliced meat, which is as gross as it sounds, stacked up sodas in the refrigerated case, cut tomatoes, and did whatever else Jimmy said to do. I guess it's obvious that Jimmy was kind of weird because no normal person would have given 40-minute-a-day 40, 40 jobs to three sixth graders. On our first day, Jimmy spent five entire minutes pointing to a plastic bank shaped like Fred Flintstone that he had on a shelf in the back room. Never touch the bank, he said. Never. When I pointed Jimmy's weirdness out to Anna Marie, she said, Yeah, but he's nice weird. Not creepy weird. You think, I said? What about the creepy cartoon bank? She shrugged. My dad collects stuff like that, too. Lots of people do. It turned out that Jimmy didn't intend to pay us any money. Instead, he let us each pick a soda from the refrigerator and make sandwiches from the stuff in the setup tray on the counter. The setup tray was just lettuce, tomato, onions, American cheese, Swiss cheese, and pickles. The other food, sliced turkey, ham, roast, beef, salami, a big tub of tuna salad and meatballs, and a plug-in pot, was off-limits. Every day, we took our cheese sandwiches back to school and ate them at our desk during silent reading period. I sat next to Alice Evans, who never complained about anything, and Anna Marie sat next to Jay Stringer, who was oblivious to the world when he was reading, but Colin sat next to Julia. Mr. Tompkin, Julia said on the Friday of our first week at Jimmy's, Colin is eating his lunch at his desk again, and I despise the smell of pickles. Mr. Tompkin looked up over the top of his book, adjusted his toothpick, and said, Try breathing through your mouth.